Welcome back everyone, this is going to be my full Justice League Snyder Cut breakdown video, easter eggs, and all the differences between this and the theatrical cut. It's basically a completely different movie, the story plays out in a very different way, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. I will be doing more Snyder Cut videos in the next couple of days. There's also another alternate version of the Justice League Snyder Cut that Zack Snyder is releasing in the next couple of weeks called the Justice is Grey Edition. It's basically going to be a black and white version of the Snyder Cut, but it will have some slightly different Joker scenes. So technically it is like a fully alternate cut. So there are two alternate cuts of the Justice League Snyder Cut. I don't know exactly when that's going to happen, but I will do a video for it when they do release it. But careful for spoilers for the Snyder Cut if you have not watched the movie yet. I'm assuming most of you have by now. Most of the basic storyline plays out similar to the theatrical cut storyline, but there are many new story elements, subplots, teasers for sequel stories for the characters like Justice League 2, Justice League 3, as well as future solo movies and teasers for the characters that they would have originally done. For instance, there's like a whole new cyborg movie worth of footage that was added back in and completely changes his character in the film. He's like the heart of the film now. The epilogue itself is almost like its own Justice League 2 sequel short film just attached to the end of the first movie. It's like a full 30 minutes long. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to focus on the major differences, like the biggest changes throughout the movie, because otherwise this would be like a six hour video. But just starting with the prologue, so they do have a proper prologue at the beginning of the movie because the movie is divided into different chapters. There are technically six chapters total, but that's also considering the epilogue, so really it's more like five chapters in the epilogue. But the prologue opens with a combination of Batman v Superman footage of Superman's death that they've added extra context to. Now you see that Superman's screams create shockwaves that resonate across the entire Earth that can be heard by all the major side characters, even the Amazons back on Themyscira, even the Atlanteans underneath the water. We learn that the three mother boxes that Darkseid lost to the forces of Earth in the flashback have been lying dormant this whole time just waiting to contact Darkseid and the forces of Apocalypse because they were afraid of Superman and potential Kryptonians. That's how powerful he's supposed to be relative to Darkseid and the other New Gods characters like Steppenwolf. So Superman's death cries let the mother boxes know that it's safe to reactivate themselves and they sound out basically what amounts to a homing beacon sort of alerting the forces of apocalypse to where they are in the universe. Because as we learn later in the film, apparently when Darkseid came to Earth, found the anti-life equation hidden on the planet, then promptly got his ass beat by the old gods with the help of the Amazons, the humans, the Atlanteans, the Green Lantern Corps, he left and for some reason lost all records of where Earth was located. Which I think is more of a story twist to explain why Darkseid is only just now coming for the mother boxes in the anti-life equation many thousands of years later. Because if he had remembered where Earth was, he would have come back thousands of years ago. But it's Steppenwolf that hears the mother boxes calling to them first, so that's why he shows up first before Darkseid hears them. So he comes to Earth to collect them, hoping that with them Darkseid will allow him to return home. There's this whole subplot with Darkseid that's completely different that I'll explain when we get to those parts of the film. It completely changes his character as well, not only physically, but his backstory as well. But then we begin with chapter one, which is titled Don't Count on a Batman, which is a reference to Aquaman's dialogue when he turns down his offer to join the Justice League, even after he gives the town a fat stack of cash. But we get a bunch of brand new scenes of Batman traveling to the frozen north to recruit Aquaman for the Justice League. Alfred says he's not for two after he returns with a no, meaning that he also asked Wonder Woman before this and she at least at first said no, but she does come around later. There are a ton of new side characters in this Nordic fishing village that we meet and we get more subplot about Aquaman visiting all the villages all over the north like this to give them aid. Just him being a good person sort of setting up the idea that even though he's very brusque, he's a very grumpy personality, he does do a lot of good things and sort of setting up the concept of him being the future King of Atlantis or the rightful King of Atlantis. Remember, the events of the Justice League movie take place before the Aquaman movie so he's not king right now when Batman is meeting him for the first time. All the character interactions are very different. They turn all these villagers into much bigger characters. We get a full traditional Icelandic song that they sing to Aquaman, sort of setting up the idea that they kind of worship him like a god king. But then you get a bunch of new beats with side characters like Martha Kent losing the Kent farm. Really the next big scene, the big different scene, is of Lois Lane visiting Superman's monument. She takes coffee to the police officer on duty that's guarding it and it's a big cameo scene. It's the actor who originally played Jimmy Olsen in the Christopher Reeve Superman movies. 
Now, he also had a cameo in the theatrical cut, but because they cut this scene, his cameo was changed to be the prison guard in Iron Heights when the Flash was going to visit his father. The first scene with Wonder Woman is essentially the same, but goes down in a very different way. It's much longer, there's way more slow-mo, there's no gratuitous ass shots in slow-mo, like she as a character is not sexualized quite as much during the Snyder Cut as she was during the theatrical cut. And she kills all these attackers very violently. You can even see the blood splatters when she bashes them against the wall. So remember, this is meant to be rated R. The Snyder Cut is rated R mostly for violence in the three, I believe, F-bombs that happen during the movie. The first F-bomb comes during this scene, during the attacker scene. The second one is from Cyborg when he meets Wonder Woman. And the third one is from the flash forward nightmare scene when Batman is threatening the Joker. Bet you never thought that you would see Batman dropping an F-bomb in a big movie. But then we get a very different version of the Steppenwolf scene coming to take the Amazon's mother box. The basic storyline is similar, but it all plays out in a very different way. Obviously, the major change, though, is Steppenwolf himself. Not only did they completely redesign his character, this is what Zack Snyder originally wanted him to look like. The studio said no. So interestingly enough, Zack Snyder was the person who created this version of Steppenwolf. But when they greenlit the Snyder Cut last year, he said that part of the terms of him coming back to do it was that he would be able to do things how he originally wanted them to do it. So they basically reversed Steppenwolf to look like he originally wanted him to before the studio made him change it. But the other big difference with Steppenwolf is that his story and his dialogue in the movie is completely different across the entire film. All of his new scenes make him feel like a much more credible threat, especially this opening scene with him. You understand his motivation more, his backstory, and his relationship with Darkseid. He's just more of a character in general. Then we begin with chapter 2, which is titled The Age of Heroes, which is a reference to the big flashback scene, the literal Age of Heroes. Later, Wonder Woman also has the dialogue where she talks about the Age of Heroes coming again. But it begins with Steppenwolf going to the Russian reactor site. There's a new scene that kind of explains why he chose this site specifically, because it's a place with a lot of nuclear waste and fallout radiation. He says it's toxic, that's good. Basically what's happening is they're terraforming Earth into a version of Apocalypse, and the idea is that the toxic environment more closely resembles the environment on Apocalypse, so it's easier for them to change this part of the Earth. Then we get a totally new scene of Wonder Woman discovering the Amazon's warning arrow and using it inside the Amazonian temple to learn the full story of Darkseid. The Amazons basically painted a Darkseid tutorial PowerPoint presentation thousands of years ago after the Darkseid War for whoever would discover the warning arrow should they need to use it. So it didn't have to be Wonder Woman finding the arrow to enter that secret room. It's just that there was no one left in the world of humans who remembered the true meaning behind the signal fire at the temple. But then we eventually meet Ryan Choi, who was totally cut out of the theatrical version at Star Labs. He winds up taking over the lab at the end of the movie, and they sort of set him up for an Adam origin story in the future sequels, the Flash movie, the Cyborg solo movie that they would have originally done. But here's the thing, Zack Snyder also revealed that he had been pitching a spin-off movie with the Atom set in China to the studio. So they would have done a full-blown Atom movie originally, but he said the studio turned him down. We get a different version of the scene of Aquaman, saving that fisherman, then going back to Atlantis just to look at the statue of King Atlan and meeting with Volko, who is also completely cut out of the theatrical version. This whole speech of Volko's is also meant to set up the events of the Aquaman solo movie. Then we get a totally new scene of Steppenwolf using the mother box to contact Dasad back on Apocalypse and let him know that he's found the mother boxes and is in the process of reclaiming the other two. And Dasad also narrates most of their shared history of the new gods, explaining why Steppenwolf was exiled from Apocalypse. If it wasn't clear from their conversation, he tried to usurp the throne from Darkseid, and then he clarifies also that he is Darkseid's family. Technically, Steppenwolf is Darkseid's uncle. For his crimes, he was sentenced to capture and convert many, many thousands of worlds. He's still got 50,000 worlds on his sentence before he's allowed to return to Apocalypse. But his whole motivation in the movie for all this is that he just wants to come home. So this is sort of like a big side quest for him. Then we get a brand new version of the Dark Side War flashback scene when she's explaining to Batman what happened with Dark Side himself back in the movie. The fight plays out mostly the same as the theatrical cut, but it's a longer version of the war with a couple different characters. You get more footage of the old gods. This is Zeus. This is Ares. We get a slightly different version of the Green Lantern scene with Yal and Gurr. I love that they have this moment with Darkseid trying to grab the Green Lantern ring before it takes off back to Oa. 
but the whole symbol that spawns out of the ground when Darkseid strikes it with his weapon is the anti-life equation itself, revealing itself inside the Earth. It's hidden on planet Earth. That's why Earth is such an important target for him. Zack Snyder has only talked a little bit about this storyline in connection with the sequels and how the anti-life equation was used, but in the Snyder Cut, Darkseid explains he's going to use it to conquer the entire multiverse, so he was going to introduce the concept of the multiverse for the first time in the DCEU during this movie. Now, we will see a version of the multiverse during the upcoming Flash Flashpoint movie, but it won't be Zack Snyder's vision of the multiverse. It'll be a little bit different. However, it will be the way that they keep the Snyder Cut in canon with all the new DC movies. They're also using the Flash movie in the multiverse to canonize the events of all the classic DC movies like Christopher Reeve's Superman, Christian Bale's Batman, the DC TV stuff like the Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover scene with Ezra Miller's Flash and Grant Gustin's Flash. And just for reference, the events of that crossover scene take place after the events of the Justice League movie because during it, Ezra Miller's Flash references long conversations he's had with Cyborg about the existence of the multiverse, which implies they've been working together for a good long while. But then we move into chapter three, which is titled Beloved Mother, Beloved Son, which is a reference to Cyborg's mother and his death or his recorded death in the car accident before his father turned him into Cyborg using the mother box. You have to imagine legally the world thinks that Victor Stone died because his father can't reveal what he did with the mother box. Then there's a totally new scene of the Flash introduction with Ezra Miller's version of Iris West. She's also coming back in the Flash movie too, so it'll be the same Iris West. I'm not sure why he's so hot to get a job as a dog walker if he's trying to earn fast cash. There are a lot of legit legal jobs that he could do to earn money way faster, but they mostly play it for comedy, especially with the hot dogs and the puppies. The Flash is mostly used for comedic relief in the Snyder Cut, just like the theatrical cut, but all the jokes themselves are different. There's a big Easter egg on this truck too. Gardner Fox was actually the comic book creator who created the Golden Age Jay Garrick Flash, which is why Zack Snyder used his name here, even though technically they're introducing the Barry Allen version of the Flash. I'm sure there'll be a bunch of Jay Garrick Easter eggs during the Flash movie when we eventually see that. I was a little disappointed though when they have this burger scene and he didn't use Big Belly Burger, just use some generic burger brand. Seems like a missed opportunity. There's a couple extra Atlantean scenes here just setting up Steppenwolf coming to take their mother box like he drags all these Atlanteans out of the ocean then uses this apocalypse tech to extract memories directly from their minds. Then you get the first half of the cyborg origin story with him flashing back to the football game. We meet his mother. We see them get into the car accident. His father vows to save his life at any cost. Later in the movie, he narrates the rest where we watch the mother box turn him into cyborg as he continues telling the other Justice League members how he became cyborg. There's almost like a small short film sequence for him just narrated by his father where you see how he's connected to all these machines. They kind of explain his abilities. Zack Snyder visualizes it in a very specific way. Eventually, you see him use his skills to give this giant fat stack of cash to the waitress in her bank account. Throughout the film, there are a couple scenes where he discusses talking to machines, like he talks to Batman's ship. The ship says that it wants to fly. There's a software issue. I think I can fix it. Then there's a very different version of the Flash scene with him meeting his father at Iron Heights, where he references his mother's death and his father being framed, all setting up the Flashpoint reverse flashback story. And even though they're doing a version of Flashpoint for the upcoming Flash movie, I don't know if they plan on including a big version of Reverse Flash because the story sounds like it's going to be very different from the comic book Flashpoint story. They haven't really said yet, but eventually at some point we will see the DCEU Reverse Flash in a future Flash story. Interestingly enough, though, we found out that Zack Snyder did not plan on making Reverse Flash a member of Lex Luthor's in Justice League during Justice League 2 and 3. It would have been Captain Cold instead. There's a different version of his scene meeting Batman for the first time. They get rid of all the K-pop music and the entire soundtrack for the movie in general. All the pop songs are different. Junkie XL did the new score. It's available on Spotify right now. I feel like it suits the tone of the Snyder Cut way better than the theatrical cut anyway. There's a brand new scene of Wonder Woman and Alfred where he sets up the idea of Batman's energy absorbing gauntlets that he uses during the Superman fight scene. Wonder Woman also asks him to make a new lasso of the same material. In black, of course. Alfred also tries to take her to school on the proper tea brewing technique, even though she's 5,000 years old. They also do clarify in the movie that she is 5,000 years old, which is how long ago the Dark Side War flashback scene is supposed to have happened, meaning that Zeus and Hippolyta would have probably conceived her sometime after this battle around the time he was getting ready to create Themyscira, before Ares full-blown civil war amongst the old gods. 
Then we get another really big scene with Steppenwolf getting the vision of the anti-life equation from the mother boxes, alerting Dasad, and then him transferring the zoom call, so to speak, to Darkseid himself. Darkseid has entered the chat, and you get that big explainer where he tells Steppenwolf about conquering the multiverse with the anti-life equation. As we move to chapter 4, Change Machine, which is a reference to the Mother Box. The reason why they say they call it that is because that's basically what the Mother Box does. It rearranges matter according to the wishes of its master, who is Darkseid. The reason why they're able to use it to resurrect Superman, though, is because when Cyborg can sort of hack it to make it think that they're Darkseid giving it orders, but also because the Mother Box itself sort of rearranges his Kryptonian DNA, his molecules, into that of a healthy Kryptonian. So sort of reversing all the damage that he took during the Doomsday fight. The whole fight scene with Steppenwolf in the cooling tower, though, goes down mostly the same with some minor changes. Zack Snyder uses some different flash jokes. Some of the action scenes are a little bit different. But the next really major new scene is Martian Manhunter, Martha Kent, going to see Lois Lane. Martha Manhunter. They reveal that Martian Manhunter has secretly been walking around as General Swanwick this whole time. This scene is mostly, though, about him getting Lois to go back to work at the Daily Planet and set up the ending scene where he comes to reveal himself to Batman. There's a slightly different version of the Superman resurrection scenes. First, Flash tells Cyborg that Superman is his hero. Then, when they're breaking into the Kryptonian ship, they walk past all of his suits like they recognize his body and think that he's there to get another suit, so they just open all those cages. I'll talk about these different suits a little bit when we get to the part where Superman actually comes back to grab the black suit. But also while they're breaking into the ship, there's a cutaway scene with Lois Lane that shows she's pregnant with Superman's child. And the storyline was meant to play a big role in the sequels. But in Justice League 2, like as we're still kind of going through the story in this first timeline, we would have found out that eventually Lois Lane has a relationship with Batman, but Darkseid would have eventually killed her and the baby, breaking Superman, leaving him vulnerable to the anti-life equation and turning him into the nightmare evil Superman you see in the epilogue ending scene. But after the Flash travels back in time and correctly warns Batman to save Lois, they fix the timeline and defeat Darkseid, Batman was eventually going to sacrifice himself, and when Lois and Superman's baby was born, they were going to name him Bruce in honor of Bruce Wayne, and the child wouldn't have had any of Superman's abilities, he would have just seemed like a normal human, but in 20 years, Zack Snyder revealed that he would become the next Batman, in a sort of Batman Beyond Terry McGinnis scenario. But you have to imagine that Bruce and Alfred probably would have made sure that baby Bruce Kent Batman would have access to all of his wealth and his Batman tech. Although because we have characters like Cyborg now working together with the Justice League creating new hyper tech, you have to imagine that Bruce Kent's future tech version of Batman would be vastly more advanced than the tech that Ben Affleck's Batman used. But I did love the way during this version of the scene that the Kryptonian ship just completely flips out because it extrapolates the nightmare timeline probabilities like, nope, this is definitely going to end badly. Please don't do this. The Mother Box gives Cyborg the vision of the potential nightmare future. It's one of the potential nightmare timelines. Later, the Joker in the epilogue claims that there's been multiple timelines. They've tried multiple times to fix the timeline. But in the nightmare scenes, you see Darkseid and evil Superman going around killing all the members of the Justice League. Like you see the dead version of Killwa, Green Lantern here, of the Hall of Justice with Batman's cowl, implying that he's killed him. And you notice that the Joker's playing card that he gave the Batman has been ripped meaning that Batman at some point in the future called off their truce and probably wound up killing Joker himself, as he said he would eventually do in the epilogue. The Superman fight scene goes down a little differently. There's no do you bleed line, thankfully, no awkward CG mustache removal. There's a brand new scene of Steppenwolf coming to take the mother box and Cyborg's father dying, sacrificing himself while marking the mother box, allowing them to track it. Then there's the totally new scene of Superman going back to the Kryptonian ship to get his black suit, which is a nice comic book deep cut for the return of Superman. Zack Snyder also said that he tried to sell the studio on a mullet for Superman to do the full comic book Easter egg, but the studio was like, no way you get to do the mullet. You also see the other Kryptonian suits that he has on the ship. There's a full Warframe suit from the comics. There's a traditional House of L armor suit like Jor-El wore during Man of Steel. There's one of Zod's armor suits, which is a little more hardcore, and then the blue suit. Then we begin Chapter 5, which is titled All the King's Horses, which is a reference to Alfred's speech to Batman, saying that all the King's horses won't be enough to march against Steppenwolf if his team isn't ready and can't work together. He also makes another Red Capes reference, reminding you of Lex Luthor's quote from Batman v Superman, the Red Capes are coming. Alfred mostly uses it in a bullfighter reference, though. Don't wave the Red Cape at the bull if you aren't ready for him to charge. 
The whole final boss fight goes down very differently, this whole third act fight, with Superman also stopping at the Batcave before he shows up to meet with Alfred briefly before he joins them. After he arrives at the fight, they destroy Steppenwolf, they spank him super hard, but they do the big record scratch reversal type of scene where the mother boxes are able to unify, start changing the planet before the Flash can use the speed force to help break their connection. Everyone dies in this moment. But the Flash is able to enter the Speed Force before the shockwave hits him, so you start to see him entering the Speed Force, running faster than he ever has before, and time begins to rewind, everything rewinds, everyone's body parts start flying back onto their bodies, even Superman's. And this is all playing out, you notice Darkseid is open to Boom Tube and is watching it all unfold like he's on some kind of cosmic zoom call. Aquaman runs Steppenwolf through with his trident, Superman punches him through the boom tube portal, and as he's flying through, Wonder Woman chops his head off, Darkseid stopping the head with the foot, crushing it under his boot. Then they have their epic gunslinger standoff moment with the Justice League and Superman, and declares to Dasad that he's going to bring his whole fleet to Earth to do things the old way. That's his very Thanos, fine, I'll do it myself kind of speech. That's basically where they begin the epilogue, and I've already done an entire video about the epilogue. It's the last 30 minutes of the movie. It's huge. There's all kinds of Easter eggs and a whole bunch of new scenes, so I'll put a link for that video at the end of this and in the description. But the one big thing that we've learned, like I said at the beginning of the video, is that in the Justice's Grey black and white version of the Snyder Cut, they're going to have an alternate Joker scene, so I will do a new video for that when they release that cut of the film. Because the movie's over four hours long, there's so many other things that I didn't discuss in the video. If there's any big questions or bigger Easter eggs that you want to talk about that I didn't mention, just write them below in the comments. I'll also do a video for the Justice League 2 and Justice League 3 sequel stories that Zack Snyder had planned to do and will probably still eventually do in some sort of comic book form with Jim Lee, maybe on the DC Black label. That video should post in the next couple of days at some point. But while you wait for everything, click here for my full Justice League Snyder Cut ending and end credit scenes video, and click here for that brand new Marvel Falcon and Winter Soldier Episode 1 video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys tonight.